Now, the term Indigenous issues, it's a, a general uh, term. Obviously, when the left talk about Indigenous issues, they're talking more about these symbolic things. But obviously, your uh, well, what you're uh, you're advocating is, you know, actual things that are going to improve the welfare of I Indigenous people, and obviously, uh, domestic violence and uh, st uh, stopping sexual abuse is uh, uh, one of the things you're a strong campaigner on. Uh, uh, we have the uh, closing the gap report uh, every year, and and it's always, you know. Uh, Grim, a grim reading. There's still life expectancy is still um, lower. There's um, not as high rates of uh, education, Indigenous uh, health and employment uh, is also another key policy area that's always uh, debated. And we have this discussion, you know, every year where we say, you know, we must do better. Uh, you know, we've, re we've really got to, you know, try and uh, improve the situation. Uh, what do we need to, to do differently in those areas of health, education and employment? Sure. Well, I, you know, I'll always start off by I think the very core issue is the family violence issue, is the, you know, abuse issue, because if we don't fix that, well, then we we can't go further to start resolving the issues when it comes to education, employment um, and health. Um, it, it is part of a health issue, I, I believe. Um, family violence, um, well, there's also mental health uh, around those issues because those that have been brought up, you know, within a household that that have been victims of violence will be will have to deal with mental health issues as well as their physical um, health issues. Um, I, I think that you know education is extremely uh, important, and as we know in the Northern Territory, um, um, levels of uh, you know kids not attending school uh, is is pretty. Uh, well, the biggest, the highest levels across the country are in the Northern Territory for kids not attending school, and this is, um, you know, this is due to once again parental responsibility. Uh, what we see also is we have young people having kids as young as you know, sometimes twelve years old. We're having babies, having babies, and ill-equipped to become parents, which is why we're seeing children being left with grandparents uh, and that cycle sort of continuing. But why, you know, we have to look at why is it that we're having 12 year olds having children and again that comes back to um, abuse, sexual abuse and that kind of behaviour which has become normalised in communities. Um, so, you know, there's all, all of these issues are interconnected. Uh, if, we, if we want to see Aboriginal people improve their lives, well then Welfare, I believe, is one of the biggest killers. Uh, passive welfare and not feeling like, you know, as a human being, uh, the motivation to be supporting your family, to be working to support your family, which is what Aboriginal people once upon a time always did. Um, when my grandfather experienced uh, white fellas first coming into his world, um, he, he he lived the land, he walked the land, he ensured his family survived off the land. But then when white fellas came along, he continued to do that. He took on uh, jobs, he took uh, mail by camelback, he was part of, um, he, he was a labourer in the army, he worked on the school grounds. Uh, when, what, where the downfall occurred was when welfare was introduced uh, in, in our country's history and when Aboriginal people were unfortunately as much as you know equal pay was about recognizing Aboriginal people as equal it also uh, meant a lot of Aboriginal people lost their jobs and that coupled with welfare was the beginning of the end for Aboriginal people prior to that we are in our in Australia's history Aboriginal people were beginning to become part of the economy uh, uh, and in fact from that point on when welfare was introduced was when incarceration rates um, began to climb for Aboriginal people as well. It's all uh, it's all related to one another. Uh, this, look, this is why I support initiatives like the the cashless debit card because I believe these are ways to help Aboriginal people to deal with um, the cash economy, which is an issue that Aboriginal people weren't 
you know, I'm speaking about my mom who live in the bush whose first language is in English, never really learnt, understood how to control a cash economy. Uh, my people, when they get cash in their hand, they will distribute it amongst family almost immediately. Um, and it worked once upon a time when they were hunter-gatherers, out bush, what, whatever wealth you had, you ensured your family survived, but that your wealth was your food. So you gave that to ensure that everyone survived. Now, when you have high numbers of alcohol um, abusers, uh, addicts within your family, there's a constant pressure and a constant demand on you to hand over your pay and your money, well then you're never actually ever going to get ahead. And so things like the cash as debit card support Aboriginal people to say, look, I can't give you my money because it's quarantined, it's my money. But it means Aboriginal people can learn how to budget. It means they can also um, keep their money and not give it to those affected by drugs and alcohol. It means that they can send their kids to school. Um, so there's issues like that. I think our children um, need to be supported better when it comes to education. Uh, yes, I believe it's important for Aboriginal kids to learn their language, but English is the most important language for kids to learn because it gives them the tools to survive in a modern world and to become part of an economy to ensure the modern way of survival, to look after your family, is to is through employment. Uh, you know, the one thing that I, will, I always point out in terms of the Closing the Gap report, it, it shows that there are more Indigenous um, graduates coming, coming out of university. Um, what I would say is, well, how many of those are actually Indigenous kids whose first language is not English. Uh, until we see more graduates coming through to university whose first language is Warbri, Pitinjara, Aranda, you know, whether it's Tiwi, whether it's Yolngu, um, unless we, until we see kids like that coming through university, then we're not closing that gap. What we're doing is we're seeing um, we're, we're, we're seeing middle-class Indigenous kids coming through university and that's that's fantastic, but the most marginalised are still the most marginalised. Uh, I think that one thing I do have a gripe with is the way in which land councils um, control Aboriginal land and money. Uh, I feel like Aboriginal people should be able to take more control over economic development and opportunities on their own country. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to land rights, uh, I think the laws need to be revisited and I think we need to give more um, responsibility to Aboriginal people on their own country to be able to create economic opportunity on their own land because as we see it now, uh, there's not enough opportunity within communities and too much welfare dependency. Uh, and I think when it comes to royalties handouts, that is also um, contributing to this idea of welfare dependency. I mean, who wants to work when you're getting large sums of royalties money distributed to your family? Uh, most of the time, and it's untaxed, the royalties uh, is spent on second-hand cars. So those who are making the most out of Aboriginal money through royalties are second-hand car dealers. Uh, so, you know, these are all issues that need to change. and. Um, with education, also health education. I think kids need to be taught in school with regard to different health issues. Um, I used to work with um, delivering health messages in remote communities through the form of musicals um, to children. And, um, you know, basic hygiene is one of the main messages that we would deliver. And, you, you know, you wouldn't believe it, but it's those sorts of it's the it's the idea that Aboriginal people in remote communities still don't know how to um, live within structures like houses. You know, Aboriginal people got given houses, but not taught how to uh, utilise houses, how to fix and repair their houses, like the simplest sorts of in the simplest ways. Um, when it comes to just basic hygiene, those sorts of issues. For, for some reason they've fallen by the wayside for a lot of Aboriginal people and, and that, that comes through education. Um, as soon as people are educated, the better. 
because also they can't be taken advantage of. You know, we see a lot of Aboriginal people in communities being taken advantage of, and I, and I hate to say it, but Labor have been, um, <laughs> certainly in the Northern Territory, have taken advantage of Aboriginal people in remote communities for years and years, and I saw it um, in my mother's, in, in the last election where my mother lost her seat. Um, you know, the because of a lot of Aboriginal people being uneducated, uh, a lot of men in those communities have controlled um, those communities for their own personal gain and benefit, for the personal gain and benefit of their immediate families and to the detriment of women and children in communities. So, you know, I could go on and on and on. There are so many issues that need to be tackled um, differently and from a more honest perspective and from a perspective where, you know, we understand really what is going on um, first before, you know, we act upon uh, what we need to act upon, but also Aboriginal people um, need to take ownership. And um, blaming, projecting blame outwardly is not working. It's not working. It, it never has, and it's not going to work if we keep doing that. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.